Hello, and welcome to the National Museum of the Pacific Wars webinar series. I'm so happy that all of you can join us this afternoon. My name is Jacqueline Mertz. I am the museum programs coordinator here. I would like to introduce our two speakers today, Reagan Grau, Director of Collections, and Chris McDougall, Director of Archives, as they provide an exciting behind the scenes look at some of the items that have been donated to the museum. Last year in 2022, Chris and I received a lot of unique donations to the collection and uh, we're here to share a few of the more unique with you today. First off is this Japanese regimental headquarters flag that was uh, flying over General Yamashita's headquarters in 1945 when it was captured by Lieutenant Sid Wells. Uh, Reagan, what did Gen General Yamashita do? At the beginning of the war General Yamashita was the conqueror of the Malay Peninsula in Singapore, accepted the British surrender at, the, at Singapore, and then he was assigned to China and had some obscure posts in China for, for quite a while before he returned to the theater, the active theater, and was appointed command over the Japanese 14th Area Army in the Philippines. And he was assigned to the Philippines right before the Americans landed at Leyte. So he showed up in the summer and prepared for the defense and was there when he was still he was still in the Philippines in command when the war ended. And he held out until September 2nd when the signing aboard the Missouri occurred. That's when Yamashita came in and surrendered. So was he on Luzon? I believe he was on Luzon. This was captured in Manila at, uh, at one of his regimental headquarters there. And you can see that it's full of uh, Japanese writing and, and things like that with perhaps signatures of staff officers, maybe some messages of good luck or well wishes. What's, uh, what's the emblem there in the center? I believe this is the Japanese kanji for strength. So what do we have here, Reagan? Chris, this is a Gertzner and Sons wooden toolbox made specially for machinists. So what is it doing here? This toolbox and the tools within it belong to a machinist that worked on the Manhattan Project. Wow. Now it came to us from uh, the machinist gave it to his neighbor, the donor, in the 70s. The donor was a budding machinist and, and received this as a gift from the uh, Manhattan Project machinist, and so he donated it to us last year. And this is full of precision tools like gauges and micrometers and calipers and things used for producing precise pieces of metal that would have been required for a, a device as sophisticated as the atomic bomb. What do you think the mirror is for? I've, I was told that the mirror is for, if a machinist gets metal shavings in his eye, he can refer to his mirror and take the shavings out of his eye. This toolbox is full of, I would guess, over a hundred tools. Oh, I remember this one. Oh yeah, this one, this one is a real feather in our cap for the collection. This is a radio receiver that was used at the Santo Tomas internment camp in Manila by the civilians that were interned there by the Japanese when the Japanese occupied the Philippines. And you could imagine that uh, this one had to have been hidden so that uh, the Japanese wouldn't discover it. And you can also imagine the, uh, the internee who's sitting using this, got these headphones on, listening to perhaps a broadcast out of Australia, picking up some of the latest war news so that uh, this person could then inform the camp of the war's progress from the Allied point of view and not that of the Japanese, which <laughs> may or may not have differed from what was really happening. But the, the, the internees would have had to have kept this hidden and, and very clandestine. Okay, these next items here, uh, have to do with uh, Barney Watipka. He was the navigator on a B-29 bomber with the 40th Bomb Group. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, it's a mixture of items, uh, both archival 
uh, paper, photographs, and 3D items, the mirror and this uh, bomb pin here. Uh, Reagan, you accepted the donation. Can you tell us a little bit about it? That's right. Uh, like you said, Watipka was in the Army Air Forces, and he was on the very first B-29 raid of the war. And the, bom the, the primer pin came from one of the bombs used uh, on the raid over Bangkok from B-29s. And, and one of the unique items about the, the Watipka collection is, as the war progressed, he collected a lot of bomb pens and, and, and labeled their missions. So we've got lots of different Japanese cities that these B-29s hit, and, and Watipka kept a lot of the bomb pens and, and wrote down the missions on the, on the tags. And another, another part of that story, Chris, is uh, the B-29 that Watipka was in had to ditch on its way back to India into the Indian Ocean. Oh, wow. And Lieutenant Watipka was able to use this signal mirror to alert the other bombers going over that they had made it, that they were safely on the water. And uh, eventually his, his uh, life raft or washed up on the shore in somewhere in India, somewhere on the coast of India. And these pictures here that are part of the archival portion of this collection depict uh, Wotipka is in here among this group, but this, this, uh, this person in the center of the picture is the village headman where these, where these uh, bomber pilots and crew crash landed. The village headman was the guy that took them into the village and helped them get back to the Allied fold. And part of the, another part of the story is that uh, Wotipka got this this uh, Indian man's address and corresponded with him briefly after the war. Why don't you tell us a little about the logbook, Chris? Well, the logbook here shows um, the mission, the mission that was flown and uh, where the crash landing occurred. It's right here. Um, oh, yeah. And there's a little bit of detail about the, the crash, but not a whole lot, surprisingly. <laughs> well, he doesn't have the... It just has one line there. That's true. <laughs> yeah. But this records lots of missions, it looks like. Oh, it does. Yeah. What else do we have? Well, this next item here is uh, very, very unique, very special. Um, this is a, uh, what they call a cruise book. Uh, but it's Japanese. This is uh, for the uh, aircraft carrier Akagi. That was... Uh... I seem to remember something about the Akagi at Midway. Right, yeah, they had to scuttle it. It was um, severely damaged and they scuttled the ship. When, when do you suppose this cruise book was produced? Um, as far as I can tell, it's from the uh, 1930s. We don't know exactly what year, but um, to verify that it's Akagi's, these two um, kanji characters right here. And by the way, uh, this is red from uh, right to left. Um, these two characters right here, they stand for Akagi. Hmm. Red and castle. That's what Akagi means, red castle. Could we get a look inside there? Maybe a couple of the pages? Yeah, absolutely. That's held up pretty well for something that's so oh, it's in, that's so old. It looks like it's in good condition. It's in remarkable condition, yeah. Chris, looks like we've got another hybrid right here. What do we have? Uh, we have a collection of metals in, in this uh, gatefold here and uh, a couple other items related to uh, First Lieutenant Albert Brown, who was killed in action on Okinawa. Did he receive the Purple Heart posthumously? He did. What about that bronze star? That was awarded for a gallant action at Okinawa as well. I see a, a, an article announcing Lieutenant Brown killed in action, but what do we have here? It's a uh, Christmas card that um, Lieutenant Brown sent home before he was killed. Chris, I've got something downstairs on display that came in last year too. You want to take a look? Oh yeah, let's go. All right. These two sculptures were donated in January of last year, and they are soapstone sculptures made by Tim Washburn, who lives and works in New Mexico. 
The larger sculpture depicts two Navajo code talkers in theater operating a radio and sending a coded message. The other smaller sculpture depicts two veterans later in life. One of them is holding a folded flag. Now, these sculptures do not depict any specific individuals, but together tell the story of Navajo's service in World War II and as veterans in the post-war era. A Washburn retrieved the soapstone from the Navajo Nation in Arizona, of which he is a member. So Reagan, what do we have here? We have a Type 92 Japanese machine gun brought to you by, or rather brought home from Guam by a, a, a Naval Construction Battalion commander. He, he brought this one home and it's, it's disassembled right now. You can see some, some pieces that we've got. Here's the rear sight post. Oh, and here's the front sight post. Yeah, and uh, here's the trigger housing and the, the wooden pistol grips, along with the rear stock handle. And um, we have the drum magazine also for the weapon. And the weapon itself. Well, this box is pretty cool. It looks like it's been custom made. Do you know anything about it? Mm, the donor wasn't so sure, but he did speculate that, the, that it's a, a box custom made for this weapon out of material that they had on hand. So, Reagan, this one's broken down. Uh, do we have one that's fully assembled? We do, Chris. When this weapon is fully assembled, it looks like this. Now. Keep in mind, this is the, the Type 92 Japanese mach light machine gun, but it might look familiar to some of you as a British yeah. Lewis gun. Okay, yeah, okay. The Japanese copied the, the Lewis gun in order to manufacture this one. So what caliber is that? Chris, this is chambered in 7.7 .7 millimeter, very much like the British 303. Okay. So speaking of Japanese aircraft, what do we have here? This is an aerial reconnaissance camera that the Japanese would have mounted to one of their aircraft in order to photograph maybe a landing beach or an enemy installation or enemy fortification or maybe some topography of a certain area. This looks like a roll of film, maybe? You, you're right. That's, that's a, a roll of film. And, and there's also deeper inside this box, another box that contains a lens that, you, that, that uh, the photographer can attach inside the, the camera's aperture there. So Reagan, where did this come from? These two, these two Japanese aerial reconnaissance cameras were donated at the same time and the donor's father picked these up at a Japanese airfield right when the occupation started, just as the war ended. Speaking of photographs, Chris, what do we have here? Well, Reagan, the uh, two photographs right here, this uh, notebook and the two pieces of artwork there, and all of the pieces in this portfolio all have to do with the war artist Milford Zorns, who served in the U.S. Army during the war. Oh, where, where did he serve? Mr. Zorns served in the China-Burma-India Theater during World War II. Oh, if I look closely, I believe I can see the, the CBI sleeve insignia right there. That's right. What's this picture? Well, this photograph right here shows uh, Mr. Zorns at work in the theater during the war. Well, what was his specialty? He specialized in uh, portraits, as you can see here, and landscapes. Was he active after the war? He sure was. Uh, he was based in California, um, and he uh, conducted uh, painting classes uh, throughout the world, and some of his works um, are in the Smithsonian right now. This is a good collection to have. It is. Yeah, we're, we're very honored to have it. Yeah. 
What's this? Well, this is uh, Mr. Zorn's notebook from right after he joined the military. Looks like it has some notes and sketches throughout this, uh, throughout this book. It does. This is uh, some of his uh, initial work uh, as a war artist. Okay. We hope you all enjoyed this sampling of the latest additions to the collection here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. We'd like to return now to the studio to answer any questions that you all may have. I hope you all enjoyed the, the video production and getting a look at some of those items. We do have uh, quite a few questions that have rolled in. Chris, you want to get us started? Uh, <clears throat> the first one is uh, from an anonymous uh, questioner. Uh, how many donations did you receive last year? We received 230 uh, donations last year. We have another question from uh, another attendee um, that asks, is it known where the radio was hidden in the camp? Uh, it was at Santo Tomas internment camp in Manila. And Santo Tomas was a university there in Manila. And uh, the allied civilians were all interned in there and other places throughout the Philippines. But uh, inside Santo Tomas, that radio was hidden in the ceiling at a theater. And so it was, it was, uh, it was hidden up, up in the, up in the ceiling, out of sight, and it was never discovered. And the, uh, the donor's father, now the donor was born in the camp in 1944 or something like that, and doesn't have much memory whatsoever of being interned, but, uh, her father was, uh, tortured to try to, to try to get some information about how the internees were interacting with civilians outside the walls, the Filipino civilians, and uh, her, her father was mistreated severely, but he never did give up the, the radio. So, and now, now we're real, we're real pleased to have it and preserve it and be able to share it with y'all. Ooh, here's another question about uh, what other Japanese firearms do we have in the collection? We've got multiple uh, firearm types from pistols to small arms to large machine guns. Uh, you saw the you saw the two type 92s. We've also got plenty of various types of air sakas. That was the standard issue for the Japanese infantrymen. Uh, we've got plenty of Nambu pistols. We have some Nambu machine guns. We have we even have a rare Type 100 submachine gun, just to, to name a few off the top of off the top of my head. Uh, looks like Pamela has a question about was Lieutenant Watipka on the Doolittle raid? I don't believe so. There's a there's a there were only how many Doolittle raiders were there? It's 100 and, 50 some odd, I don't remember, but Watipka was not on the Doolittle Raid. I uh, have another question here, one about the um, cruise book. Uh, is it known how the Akagi uh, book survived the sinking and the war since the ship was sunk in 1942? Well, the simple answer to that question is that uh, that crew member wasn't on the Akagi when it was uh, sunk. Uh, so it, it survived all this time. Uh, another question here. Uh, my father served on Tinian with the 6th Bomb Group and was a B-29 crewman. Uh, is there a way to find out his service record um, survived the fire at the Personnel Records Center? Um, are the World War II records that survived cataloged anywhere? Um, that massive fire pretty much wiped out all the army records. Um, so all army air force records were destroyed, but they can recreate uh, a file for you. Um, it's still worthwhile to contact them. They're in St. Louis and, and uh, make a request. Uh, they do have a long backlog, but they can still help you. Here is an anonymous uh, question from another viewer. And uh, will there be an attempt to translate all the writing on the captured Japanese flag? 
there is a lot of interest in those type of uh, flags. And one astute observer uh, noticed that the flag that was mounted in that frame, uh, he recognized the kanji for strength. That's how we that's how we knew that it was the kanji symbol for strength. And um, we've had various scholars come to the museum and, and uh, take a deep dive into our flag collection and translate some of the some of the Japanese characters. And in the process has has discovered that some of them are fake <laughs> because enterprising GIs would take parachute silk, paint a red circle on it and start coloring gibberish characters in black all over these flags sometimes and sell them to <laughs> souvenir hunters. And so we have a few of those in the collection. We have some that are authentic. And uh, if we get a chance to get um, uh, these translated, this one, this one would be a good one to have translated since it's got such good provenance and has a compelling story and a connection to General Yamashita. Mm -hmm. I've got another question here. Uh, do you have a lot of art in your collection? Uh, yes, we do. We have a variety of art from um, ordinary servicemen uh, who uh, drew on envelopes, and we have a lot of actual uh, war art, uh, like the examples that you saw there from uh, multiple uh, war artists. I seem to recall we have some from Arthur Beaumont as well. We just had a that's we just right. closed uh, an exhibit with some of his artwork. We have a few of his originals in, in our collection as well. Uh, another question here from uh, regarding some machine guns. How do you take care of the weapons in your collection? Are they ever cleaned? Well, we do uh, our best to preserve these, these weapons. Uh, we have a process underway right now. We're going to discuss it in a, a future webinar later in the summer about what we're doing to preserve these weapons. Uh, short answer, yes, we are. Uh, tune in later for more details on exactly how and what we're doing and get a good glimpse into the kinds of weapons that we do have in the collection. Got a question about volunteering here. Uh, is it possible to volunteer to help transcribe letters at the museum? Yes, absolutely. Um, the person to contact is uh, Kina down at the education department, and uh, she can help you with that. I see one more question from Sam getting uh, so many artifacts. Uh, how do we decide what will be displayed in the museum? That's a uh... A lot of times the items that we choose to display in the museum uh, depends on the item's provenance or the story behind the item, because we like to try to attach personal stories to these artifacts to, to sort of make our exhibits more impactful and more meaningful and more memorable. And so if, uh, if an item's got a really good story behind it, chances are it'll be a good contender for display. And by meaningful stories, uh, if you recall seeing the Watipka collection and all of those, you know, that signal mirror and those bomb pens and the photographs and, and things like that, those are, you know, if, if we know the item's provenance, then then it's a, it's a good, like I said, good contender for display. Uh, let's see, Whitney would like to know, do we also fire the weapons? Uh, we have a, we have a, uh, another collection of weapons that uh, is used for educational purposes. And, and a lot of those are in fact adapted for blank fire and are featured in living history programs here at the museum. And so uh, some of the weapons are in fact fired, but we also have those that are in the permanent collection that uh, are not, uh, they're, they're, not they're, they're used only for uh, display purposes, not necessarily for educational purposes. And so we, we do have uh, plenty of both. Got a question here about um, making donations. Um, do you actively seek out artifacts or just rely on donations or leads you may receive? Well, the majority of items that, are, uh, that come to us uh, are offered via donation, but we are interested in hearing about other items. Uh, 
So if you have any out there, please uh, contact us for sure. Uh, here is one from Don. Would like to know if we have the flag that was hoisted on Iwo Jima. I presume that's a reference to the famous flag raising and Joe Rosenthal's photograph and possibly the one that preceded it. Uh, no, we don't have either of those flags in our collection. It would be <laughs> it would be very nice to have something like that, but uh, we don't have those from Iwo Jima. Seems like we've got time for one more question, and uh, that one is, how do you donate to the museum? Well, you're welcome to call either Chris or myself. We're, uh, we can be reached through the museum's website, and um, you're welcome to inquire with us about uh, how and what to donate. Um, we hope that you all have enjoyed this webinar and a glimpse into what we received as gifts last year. This concludes our webinar for today. So we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for attending. Thank you.